good morning. Um, and on behalf of EDARA, the European Development and Research Academy, it's my pleasure to welcome you all here today to this morning's roundtable event. So our next speaker is uh, Mr. Maurizio Geri. Welcome. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Geri is uh, a security analyst and advisor and a former NATO analyst. And we will now move on to focus specifically on the NATO China relationship and also on the US-China rivalry in the South China Sea. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you uh, to Edara and to Brahim for the invitation and uh, to the moderator. Uh, I come from Italy, so uh, we talk a lot, but I know I'm before the, the coffee, so we'll try to be brief and quicker. But I thank Theo uh, for the uh, spot yeah, on NATO. <laughs> Ah, oh wow, so you speak some Italian, great. Yeah, we will talk in Italian later for the coffee. So, um, as uh, the moderator said, I spent five years in NATO as an analyst. So, uh, you know, when you work in NATO, uh, you are always NATO, because uh, NATO, we forget uh, about that, but it's a political military alliance. So before it's a political alliance, and then it's a military alliance. It's a political alliance of uh, democracies. So as itself is already alternative to the Chinese model of uh, dictatorship. But until last year, actually, NATO didn't mention China in its strategic concepts because uh, China was not a threat. Now, uh, in February of last year, before the invasion of Ukraine, uh, Xi Jinping and uh, Mr. Putin signed an agreement in which they said we are alternative to the international order. So, uh, during the Madrid summit, NATO brought in the strategic concept, we need to deal with the systemic challenges posed by China. What does it mean? This growing coercive and aggressive narrative and actions of China meant that China was going to be a challenge, not yet a threat, a challenge to the values, interest and security of NATO. Values, interest, and security. These are clear words because, you know, uh, in the political world, uh, there are many uh, narratives, and nowadays we live in the post truth and the post, uh, you know, uh, facts, uh, information, and communication society. But when you come to China, you have to understand what is written, for example, in the agreement with Mr. Putin, which is, we are the real democratic states. They speak about our democracy is better than yours. And when Theo speaks about human rights uh, related with democracy, we understand what is democracy in the West, is also the respect of the rights of every individuals. And in other countries, it's not always like that. But I repeat, until last year, there was no mention of China in the NATO uh, strategic uh, documents. Now, uh, another thing we forget about NATO is the fact that it's not only a collective and uh, defense uh, organization, it's not only based on deterrence and defense, but they have two more pillars. One is crisis management and one is cooperative security. So for 20 years, uh, Russia and NATO spoke in the NATO-Russian Council, created by Berlusconi in 2002 in Rome, until February 2022, a few days before the invasion, there still was the meeting between NATO and Russian Council. Now, with China, NATO has a staff-to-staff -staff military talks. This is online, it's public, it's not a, you know, I'm not saying any a classified information. The recently February one was the seventh staff-to-staff -staff talk. So there is an engagement, there is a constructive engagement with China. Uh, the international military staff spoke about the modernization of military in China, the security on the Indo-Pacific, the Russian invasion and other topics that the Chinese are also interested. So, but how this dialogue can be improved when the Indo-Pacific area, and specifically the South China Sea, and we will speak about that more specifically, is increasingly militarized by China. So if you grow economically is one thing. Is if you also grow militarily, militarizing, for example, the islands in South China Sea, which is the first uh, chain of islands that we recognize in China, right? The Taiwan and the South China Sea islands. Or your wolf warrior diplomatic approach saying we are preparing for war. That's what Xi Jinping said recently on Taiwan or on other topics. Uh, how cannot be seen as a challenge to the international order that you, China and Russia, 
for itself also signed when we signed all together the chart of the UN after the World War II. So there is a uh, challenge that we are worried in the West and we have to deal with this. We have to speak with this uh, international level at UN level because uh, the cooperative security of uh, NATO is going internationally with many countries. Uh, first of all, with international organizations, UN, African Union, for example, not yet ASEAN, but uh, f because ASEAN, we all know that it belong the, 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 to the NAM, to the non-aligned movement, the, 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 the states of Asia, ASEAN. So obviously they look uh, for the third way, as they, they say also in the Mongolia, we have uh, someone here from the Mongolia uh, state. Uh, but the cooperative of security or pillar of NATO has been always looking for uh, security all around the world for democracies. Because we have, for example, the uh, global uh, partners. So uh, New Zealand, Australia, South Korea and Japan, they are the Indo-Pacific or the Pacific partners of NATO. Because they are democracies that feel in some way threatened by this growing military growing, not only economic growing, of the uh, dominant power in Asia which is China. Now, uh, going uh, to specifically to uh, what the moderator said, the, China, uh, the, the, the US, Chinese rival, rivalry, we, we need to say that the, the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, has been until now a, a, a peaceful, I mean, uh, multilateral place, including South China Sea, but is increasingly m a militarized area, a militarized area with increasing defense partnership that we feel, uh, the, the, with, with also growing of defense budgets, not so only from China, but from India, etc., that in the next 20 or 40 years could be the most militarized uh, place in the world, including more than the Atlantic. Why? Because, for example, one thing that I learned from the militaries, I'm a civilian, uh, I'm not a military, I learned that the militaries, they do strategy for site analysis. They look at the next 20, 40, 60 years. What are the trends? At the climate level, for example, we have climate security, which is a new pillar you know, of security for NATO. But we look also to the militarizations of the regions. And we see that the militarization is increasing. And, the, and this is not bringing more security, it's bringing more insecurity. So the, the, um, you know, the Chinese attempt to use what we call it the DME strategy, uh, diplomacy, information, military and economy. A strategy to uh, coerce and, uh, and um, enter like uh, in, a, in a spheres of influence of the, of the regions outside in the periphery of China, we see it as a challenge. So uh, uh, now US and China, they have also a rivalry, not only at military level or a political level or at economic level. They, they also have a challenge and, and, the, and the rivalry, and that's what I wrote recently in an article, at big data and uh, internet level. Why? Because, um, I don't know if you mentioned, I think you didn't mention in my presentation, but I uh, just got the Marie Curie from European Union to study the NATO-EU cooperation in emerging disruptive technologies, meaning quantum computing, artificial intelligence, big data. These areas are increasingly an area of competition and challenge between US and China, and in particular in the South China Sea. Why? Because we forget that the internet uh, in the world pass through subsea cables, not through the uh, satellites, as we many people think, but 99% of the internet, including military uh, security information, all, I mean, your private data, financial transactions, pass through undersea cables, fiber optic cables. Now, uh, mostly of these cables, around 500 cables in the world, 490, are controlled by US big techs. Uh, Google, Yahoo, and other uh, companies that uh, have the laying of these cables. And who lays this cable also has the power in some way to control the information that pass through this cable, if they want. In the West, we have in the European Union a process of acts uh, for artificial intelligence, for uh, an internet to control the privacy and the regulations that can control the uh, information passage. But is not something that China, for example, probably would have, because we know that China is, is a, a one-party system dominated that, if has the control of the internet, for us in the West is a little bit worried. So China is proposing to build a 500 million cable, subsea cable, between the uh, South China Sea, the countries of South China Sea, uh, bypassing uh, the um, 
the Malaysia uh, um, Strait, the, the, the uh, what's the name of the, the what? Sunda Strait. Sunda Strait. And this is a worry for us. Why? Because until now, as I said, the information passed through the cables that were in the hands of the uh, private companies. But if a state company control a cable like that, 500 million cable that will connect Middle East, Europe, and the Eastern Asia, China, and the rest of the, the area, it's a little bit worried. So. Uh, there is now, uh, I think someone later will speak specifically of uh, the um, 15 billion, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, case against uh, the uh, Malaysia country because uh, there is a, a issue there in which practically uh, some hairs um, of the ancient Sulu, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, sultanate. Uh, denounce uh, Malaysia country because of uh, the Sabah region, which is a region in the, in the Malaysia uh, current state. They denounce uh, this uh, control uh, of uh, the area and uh, they won the case and uh, some uh, uh, of the assets uh, in the Luxembourg has been already taken from Malaysia. Now, this creating some uh, rivalry between Malaysia uh, and the uh, you know, US because these uh, firms that defend the hairs of the Sulu are American or UK firms. So this could create a conflict and we don't want to create that conflict because uh, obviously we don't want uh, Malaysia, for example, to go in the spheres of influence and in the area of Chinese domination because we were all worried last year, as you may remember, uh, in February when the Solomon Islands made a strong agreement with China, allowing Chinese military and police forces to go to Solomon Island in case of a uh, social uh, uh, rebellion or something like that uh, in, the, in the agreement. This means that China will be able to move not only in the first uh, you know, chain of islands or in the second, which is Philippines and islands, but in the third chain of islands, which is the Pacific Islands, the Solomon Islands, to do actions, military and the security actions in a country that is also uh, you know, fledgling uh, democratically. Uh, that, uh, the, the problem is also that these countries, you know, they are in a process of democratization and they have to decide maybe which, which side to take. So, uh, there is an increasing, uh, you know, aggressive action economically, militarily, uh, inf at for inf information level, at narrative level, uh, narrative level of uh, China. But this is also going together with some tech and internet invasion that is worrying a lot the West. We, we could talk about this more. Uh, I'm open to questions and more discussions. But my uh, presentations, I want to close it saying that. NATO is always looking for dialogue with countries around the world uh, for peace and stability and for respect of the rule of law, the international order, the sovereignty and the territorial integrity of all countries, including the countries in South in Southeast Asia and, and, and the Indo-Pacific that feel a little bit worried of this growing of China. Thank you very much.